I want to tell you about two kinds of motivational state. Now this will eventually be relevant to our question about the mark of action, but it will take quite a while, two or three sections in fact, before you'll have the relevance explained to you. So hang tight, let's just focus on this material as if it was connected to nothing else at first, we'll make the connections much later. Motivational states. What's, what's meant by motivational state? Well, on the one hand, there are things that we often call desires. So things like you might desire chocolate in preference to rhubarb, or you like red things over blue things. And now these are things, these desires, which are influenced by learning, fashion, and the rest. Uh, so at the moment, the fashion might be to drive around in a red car. Next year, it could be that blue cars are more fashionable. On the other hand, there are what are sometimes called primary motivational states, states which are not directly modifiable by learning or fashion. These are things such as hunger, thirst, lust, aversion, and the rest. And these are important because in the animal learning theory, a lot of the animal learning theory is about these primary motivational states. Very simple question. Can your primary motivational states diverge from your desires? Should we think about these as essentially all one kind of thing? Is it all really what we might loosely call desire? Or rather, in fact, multiple systems of motivational states, the primary motivational states on the one hand, the desires on the other, can they operate independently from one another in the sense that you might desire something to which you're averse, so that the two things would be pulling you in opposite directions? Well, to see whether or not they can, I need to start with two basic premises. The first is that toxicosis directly influences only primary motivational states, things like aversion. And by toxicosis, of course, I mean essentially being poisoned. Uh, so if you are one of those people who goes out and drinks too much beer, um, you, of course, are mildly poisoning yourself. And you, you know that because you feel awful the next morning, you have the hangover, which is the mark of the toxicosis. Uh, now, I want to tell you a little story actually about toxicosis, uh, which does indeed involve drinking too much. Um, so you might remember from a while ago, I was telling you about this party in Basingstoke uh, that I was at. Anyway, at the party at Basingstoke, I had a novel food. So I was presented with some papaya and I'd never had papaya before. You haven't had it either. It's delicious, actually. I really, I loved it. Absolutely enjoyed it. I, I was eating this papaya and um, I also had some drinks at the party. It was a wedding, actually. Yeah, some, some friends were getting married. Uh, so it was very nice, and, and I had some drinks. And, you know, to tell you the truth, I'd been um, a little bit constrained in the past, and I was really letting rip. And so I drank too much. And do you know what? I woke up the next morning uh, suffering from toxicosis with an awful hangover. And I thought to myself, do you know what? The thing that will cure this is some of that delicious, juicy papaya. That's just the thing that will sort me out. So I wandered downstairs and I uh, made a request at breakfast. I said, you know, have you got any papaya? Can you bring me some papaya? And sure enough, I was brought a plate of papaya. I smelt it and immediately experienced the most horrible reaction to it, sort of retching. And I realized there was no way I could eat that plate of papaya. What had happened? Well, the toxicosis, which I knew, of course, was a consequence of the drinking rather than anything else, in combination with the novel food, had influenced a primary motivational state. It had made me averse to papaya. Right? This is a very good defensive reaction that is found in, in many animals, not just humans. If you have a novel food and toxicosis, you'll become averse to the novel food. And the idea there is that will prevent you from getting sick again. Right? Very basic preservation mechanism. However, that aversion that I had to the papaya caused by the toxicosis hadn't altered my desire. I continued to desire that food. So it looks like my aversion went one way, pulling me away from do not eat this thing. My desire went the other. I ordered that papaya. I wanted the papaya until, of course, I encountered it. And the point where I encountered it, I suddenly realized, wow, this is horrible. I do not want papaya. And now my desire aligned with the aversion. So I've been telling this story. It's not actually my story. It's due to uh, a very great researcher called Tony Dickinson. 
Uh, it's really his story. He told the story about some melons. I was just adapting it to my Basingstoke experience. And you can experience the story for yourself. Very simple, have some novel food, uh, make yourself sick, become averse to the novel food. Uh, and however much you might think you want that food, your first encounter with it will tell you that you do not want that food. No more papaya for me ever. I'm all fit for life. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. Toxicosis directly influences only primary motivational states. The desire can be left intact for some time. That answers our question already. That answers our question already. Your primary motivational states can, in fact, diverge from your desires. That's exactly what happened to me with the papaya uh, when I wanted it but was averse to it. Two motivational states pulling in opposite directions. They're incompatible. But what we want to do is to go beyond just anecdotal evidence. We want to see if we can demonstrate a separation between different kinds of men, uh, motivational states in a way that's reproducible. So I need a second premise, which is that primary motivational states directly influence only stimulus-driven actions. Um, what do I mean by a stimulus-driven action? I mean an action which is pulled out of you by the presence or absence of the stimulus itself rather than any representation of it. So for example, in the case where you're averse to the papaya, when you're brought the papaya, in, in response to the papaya itself, the smell and so on, you are actually retching that. Oh, it's quite unpleasant. Uh, that's a stimulus-driven action. The mere thought of the papaya and all the rest of it, that doesn't produce the same action. That you know, bodily revulsion that you feel is a stimulus-driven action, one which is only driven by the stimulus, not by any thoughts or representations of it or anything else. Now, these premises are, uh, of course, empirical premises, so it's possible that they're false, but they're supported by roughly half a century of research on animal learning. So they're pretty sound premises. There's not a lot of mileage in questioning those. Now, let me introduce you to the standard procedure, which is used to change uh, desires that an animal, including a human, might have. The procedure is called devaluation. So let's see what happens here. Uh, what we're going to do is put a rat into a chamber with a lever and pressing the lever will dispense the papaya or sucrose solution, right? The papaya equivalent. So what, what the rat's going to do, uh, it's going to scamper around the chamber a bit, it's going to spot the lever, it's going to press the lever and, and actually there'll be a room called a magazine and it'll go into the room and it'll find some papaya and what happens is anytime it presses the lever, ka-ching, some of the uh, papaya comes out into the room, into the magazine and the rat can go and get that. And after a while it will just, you know, if enough experimenting, it will have figured out how this thing works and it'll be pressing that lever just like me in Basingstoke enjoying the papaya, the rat will be enjoying that sucrose. And then comes the devaluation phase. Uh, so the rat's taken down to a different chamber and given a mild poison, so it suffers toxicosis. Um, and then it's exposed to that papaya, the sucrose solution, uh, while it's ill. So this is the devaluation phase. And then the extinction test, the rat goes back to the chamber where the lever is, where pressing the lever actually does nothing. There's no reward or not. And we just see how much the rat presses the lever. So here's the kind of results which are absolutely typical of this devaluation paradigm. It's a very, very standard thing, been done hundreds and hundreds of times. And what you see here is we compare a rat, this is the left column here, we can compare the frequency with which a rat who has had this experience presses the lever, and a frequency of a different rat who's had a different experience. So what this rat has done is that this rat had a different food, right? So let's say that was uh, completely different from papaya. So let's say it was uh, a blue cheese, a delicious blue cheese, right? A stilton. And this rat's been given stilton. It was really enjoying that stilton. Mmm, delicious. And, and then it was poisoned. And so it became averse to the stilton. And what you see now is that when the rat goes back into the chamber where the papaya is, this rat's pressing that lever away pretty frantically, twice as often, a bit more than twice as often as this rat, which has had the papaya devalued. Makes perfect sense. This rat, papaya devalued, not really pressing the lever very much. Smart rat. This rat has had stilton devalued, it's pressing the lever to get the papaya quite a bit. It still likes papaya. Okay, now that's very simple. I haven't told you anything very controversial so far. Here's the really interesting bit though. Actually, sorry, let me skip this. Uh, here's the really interesting bit. What happens if we take away that sucrose exposure? We take away that sucrose exposure. So what we're gonna do now is take the rat, poison it, 
But just like I was in Basingstoke, we don't give it any of the papaya or the sucrose solution, anything that it's been to, uh, uh, experienced before. After that poisoning event, it only gets it during the first stage. What's going to happen now? Well, if you think that primary motivational states and desires are kind of locked together, that they can't come apart, then we should get essentially the same results as we had before. During the extinction phase, we should see decreased lever pressing. But if you think that, as I was suggesting earlier, your primary motivational states, your aversion and your desire can come apart and they can even pull it, push in opposite directions. Well, in that case, you're going to predict quite a different result. You're going to think that taking away the exposure to sucrose is going to prevent the rat from experiencing its own bodily reactions to the papaya, the sucrose, and therefore that the rat's going to happily carry on pressing the lever in extinction because it still thinks it wants that papaya, right? Just like I did. And let's see what happens. You know what happens. I wouldn't be telling you this. Uh, so here you go. Here's the rat who's uh, who was treated before. We're just thinking about the mean number of lever presses. Uh, so it's poisoned uh, and then give an experience of the papaya and you see that it's pressing the lever quite a bit less than the other rats. This midden column has been poisoned as well, same toxicosis as the first rat, but it didn't get a chance to re-experience the papaya or the sucrose solution. So now it's tapping away just as much as a third group of rats who were not given the sucrose solution in connection with the toxicosis, so not averse to it, but we're given the experience of the sucrose solution. So these rats are still happily tapping away. What we've learned then is something very simple and beautiful. If you take a standard devaluation procedure, but remove any encounter with the novel food, the papaya, after the rat has experienced the poisoning, you don't get the standard devaluation effect the reduced lever pressing. What that's suggesting to us is that the uh, aversion and the desire can come apart. But it actually gets better than that because I mentioned earlier that the setup is like this. There's a cage with a lever over here, so I'm gonna press the lever in order to get the papaya. But in order to uh, then actually eat the papaya, I have to go into a little room called the magazine and extract the papaya there from a bowl where it comes. So what we can look at, as well as looking here, how often does the rat press the lever, we can look at how often does the rat enter the magazine. That's what the second uh, three bars are showing you. And what you see here is incredibly beautiful. So as long as the rat is averse, that's the first two bars on your left there, the rat is not really entering the magazine nearly as much as the rat, which is not averse to papaya. So there's a rat here. This is the really interesting rat. There's a rat here, which is pressing the lever, bam, 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 just as much as the rat that's not been made averse to papaya at all. But when it comes to entering the magazine, that stimulus-driven action, this rat is behaving exactly as the rat who's been given the standard devaluation procedure. So here's a rat whose behavior in a way is incompatible. It's pressing the lever, which is what's getting at the papaya. But when it goes over to the magazine, it's like, what? don't think I want to go in there, and it's not going into the magazine. Beautiful, beautiful. So what this is telling us is, is very simple. It's telling us that aversion and desire can come apart. You're, you can become averse to something while continuing to desire it, or presumably conversely. So these are two quite different kinds of motivational states. Your aversion does not directly influence your desire. You have to have the experience of the thing that you're averse to, your own bodily reaction to it, in order for your desires to be updated. Uh, and Belaine and Dickinson say this in a complicated way that's worth paying attention to because it gives us an extra level of precision. They say not only must consumption of the reinforcer, this is the papaya sucrose solution, be paired with toxicosis, that's not enough, the animals must also have an opportunity to contact the reinforcer, the sucrose papaya, after aversion conditioning, if there is to be a change in instrumental performance in the lever pressing. This pattern of results, they say, accords with a role for incentive learning in the reinforcer devaluation effect. It's not enough for your primary motivational states to change. There has to be some further learning before your desires will update. So I was asking the question, can your primary motivational states dissociate from your desires 
And what we've seen is that the answer to that question is yes, they can. They can indeed. So when we think about these, the difference between what are sometimes called primary motivational states and desires, we should recognize that there are distinct processes which are independent in the sense that one can change quite dramatically while the other stays static, even though those two things are pulling you in opposite directions. You order the papaya for breakfast, but when it comes, there's no way that you can eat it because you're averse to the papaya, just like that rat pressing the lever in the chamber, but not entering the magazine.